Welcome to the FNO InsureTech Podcast, a place where movers and shakers from all points within the insurance ecosystem gather and discuss all things InsureTech. We talk about how technology and innovation are affecting and driving change in the industry. Here are your hosts, Lee Boyd and Rob Beller. Hey, Podcast World. Welcome to another fabulous Wild Hi. Animal Edition. <laughs> of FNO InsureTech. I am one of your hosts, Rob Beller. Yeah. Not to be confused with the other host, Lee Boyd. Hi, everybody. How are you, Lee? Happy Good. New Year. Happy New Year. I'm excited to be back on the podcast bandwagon. Yeah, we've kind of had a little podcast break. A little hiatus. But we're back. So for all one of our um, fans out there, Astrid, mm-hmm. Yeah. Hi, Astrid. Hi, Good Astrid. Good to see you again. Happy New Year. Good to see you. Happy New Year, Astrid. Uh, for you, we're back. We're back. And live. Well, it's live to well, us. Well, it's live right now as we're recording it. <laughs> this is not computer generated. That's right. Which you can tell by the level, by the intellectual level of the conversation. <laughs> it really is exciting to be back, though. I've missed our podcast audience. and I've missed talking to our guest. I love talking to the guest. Yeah. That's that's great. We we talk and we learn and we learn and learn, and today is no different. Today we have an alumni, a two timer. Yep. He's now this is his second time, and a company who has been so good to us. If you are into hippo, if you follow hippo, if you're about hippo, FNO InsureTech is your source for, for all hippo, things hippo. For all things hippo, and yes, today we round it out. We round out the C-suite with Chris Donahue, Chief Underwriting Officer at Hippo. Yeah, Chris is going to come on. He's going to talk all about uh, Hippo. He's going to talk a little bit about his journey from where he was to where he is now, why he made those moves. And then we're going to get to understand a little bit of Hippo's philosophy and and the way that they do business. He's a, he's a great guy to talk to, super down to earth. And uh, extremely knowledgeable. I mean, he's been in the industry forever, it seems like. And uh, and I'm excited to, to get a visit with him again. He uh, is a really interesting guy, really smart. He's, he he um, has an amazing background. And we were interested, among other things, besides what he does and, and, and how they swing it all at Hippo, is uh, why he would um, go from huge successful insurance companies to a startup. And um, he has interesting answers about that too. Yeah. But I mean, really is a hippo, a startup. I mean, they have a a huge, I mean, it's a big company now. Yeah. Yeah. I guess, I guess, are they still a startup? Uh, I think if you ask them, they would say that they are a growing insurance company that still has a startup energy. To it, I like that they had to they had to use that as a tagline. Uh, th- yeah, think I think they'd buy it from me. Maybe, I guess trademark it between now and when they hear okay. it. Okay, okay. Well, then we better get to the podcast so I can go down to the trademark office right now. <laughs> That's right. Go for it. Okay. Without further ado, let's get to our interview with Chris Donahue, the Chief Underwriting Officer at Hippo Insurance. Hey, everybody! We are here with our special guest, another. Hippo guy, because we've had a couple of hippo one guys. Or two. One or two. One or two. One or two. I think the award winner, Lee, for the most generous carrier is to this podcast has been Hippo. Yeah, I would agree. But we love visiting with the people because it's a, it's a very exciting company. It's and such it, a great it, story. And it, and it really fits our mission of talking to insure tech type companies. Absolutely. Because this, uh, when you look up the word insure tech, there's a hippo. That's There's right. A picture of a hippo right there. That's right. So we have with us today a C guy, the chief underwriting officer from Hippo Insurance, Chris Donahue. Welcome to our podcast. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. It's a pleasure to have you here. And we two-timer. know the answer. Two timer. That's right. Two timer. Right. He he did talk on that last one at ITC. Yeah. Yeah. We had a little panel with you and Rick and Asaf. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Great time. 
So you've been indoctrinated. So now we get to ask you the hard questions. Great. Yeah. So we already know the answer to this, but where are you today? I am in New Jersey, Atlantic Highlands, New Jersey. Wow. Where's that? It is on the northern part of the shoreline, close okay. to Sandy Hook. Welcome from New Jersey. Well, but Hippo is about as far away from you as it can be, right? Our headquarters are in Palo Alto, California, and then we also have an operations center with the majority of employees in Austin, Texas. But we've opened uh, an office here in New Jersey You know, when we purchased Spinnaker Insurance Company. Mm -hmm, yeah. They had an office and a uh, footprint here. So we've adopted that, and we, we have a growing uh, number of uh, folks that are being hired in New Jersey at this point. Cool. So let's uh, take a minute and tell us, what is it that you do? You know, everybody hears about underwriting, but no one really understands it. So I, yeah. tell us, what do you do, Chris? I think most folks would tell you that the underwriter is the guy who says no all the time, right? There the, you the, right. You know, what we don't want to write. I see it a little bit differently. I see it as a portfolio management position. I see it as a position where you identify who your core client is, the client that is aligned with your value proposition and the service and the offerings that you provide, and how do you find those people in the, in the marketplace, attract them to your production sources. And with Hippo, it's an omni-channel production model. So whether it's a direct through online, a direct connection, whether it's through a third-party producer, whether it's through one of our partnerships, my goal is to grow the business in a profitable manner. Growth is definitely part of my objective, but also doing it, you know, in a profile of a book geographically and by customer that makes sense for us. That's the real trick of what an underwriter does, right? Is that it's not so much about gaining policies, which I'm sure the revenue people at the company really want. Right. I don't really care where it is. It's a policy, right? right. But it's your job to say, you know what, we need less over here and more over there. Correct. And, and at Hippo, it's, it's interesting. Like one of the things that was really interesting to me in this opportunity was our focus on risk mitigation, the focus on what type of client that looks like and how can we help that client in the marketplace. Truthfully, that, that client is underserved in the marketplace today. You know, we're actively trying to provide that customer, that Hippo client with the tools that they need to maintain their home, to prevent loss, to mitigate against loss. And I think, you know, filling that space in the market is really a huge opportunity for us going forward. Huge. huge. So is that trying to ensure the folks who are interested in using some of the IoT devices or they're interested in using some of the mitigation channels you have? Is that really what you're focusing on? Yes, absolutely. So um, as you guys know, we, we have the most widely adopted smart home oh, uh, yeah. program in the industry at this point. I, I think the number is we've sent out over half a million devices, wow. you know, water sensors, security devices, fire alarm, burglar alarm devices uh, to our clients. And, you know, we've got partnerships with with really reputable, you know, security firms like Simply Safe. Yeah. That is at the core of what our objectives are, right? What we want to do is we want to find clients who will partner with us in helping them prevent loss. Uh, we feel that the best claims experience is not to have a claim in the first place. Yeah. We've all been around insurers, and, and there's nothing wrong with this. This is not a derogatory statement, but insurers who build their value proposition around claims. And absolutely, that makes a lot of sense. It's the product that we sell, the indemnification at the end of the day. But I think, to me, empathetic, fair claims handling is table stakes. That's, mm -hmm. if, Correct. If, you're, if you're not doing that as an insurer, you're failing everybody. So assume that we do that well and we make an investment in that. And it's not that by the focus on mitigation that we ignore claims. Claims is wrapped up tight and we do claims well. What we want to make sure is that that's the backstop. That an empathetic, fair adjustment process is the backstop if we fail to prevent the loss in the first place. But the focus is, let's just not have the claim. Well, that's really interesting because a lot I think a lot of carriers see their product as the claim ability and capability and that we're always there for you kind of thing in, in times of need. Like you see commercials where there's a catastrophe that's happened and this, you know, we're here for you now which right. is important. And I mean, that's a big part of the picture, no question. But what you guys are saying is our product is about doing everything we can to either to inhibit that from occurring, 
right? Yes. Not that we can't take care of you, then we can, but let's see if we can keep you from getting there. Right. And it's, it's as much a service as it is a product, right? It mm-hmm. says it's what we sell is not just the contract. I think we used to see that as our sole product, right? Is the form that sits in front of you that outlines the coverages that you're provided. That's the backstop. The service that we provide is how can we partner with you to make sure that you're properly insured up front, that you've identified and are acknowledgeable about the exposures to your home, that you have the tools in place to be able to protect yourself from losses to that home. You know, our clients, you know, their homes are oftentimes their most valuable asset. And the home today has become so much more than just a home. It's in, in COVID, it's, it's your home, it's your gym, it's your office, it's your movie theater. Right. There's nothing more important than that in, in individuals' lives. How do we make sure that they, they're able to stay in that home, avoid loss, and that they don't have to worry about things going sideways? So whenever you're working with these IoT devices for these water sensors and things, how do you know if they're actually preventing claims? I know early on, we talked to companies like Notion and they were saying, you know, it's a struggle to actually show that we stopped the claim because we we did stop the claim and we didn't know how big it'd be because we stopped it. We stopped the damage. What are you looking at to know if your ideas and your philosophies are actually working? So one advantage of having the most lightly adopted smart home program is that we also are able to know when they're activated, how they're activated. As a data guy, I mean, you're an underwriter. Underwriting is a lot about data and and being steeped in it and knowing it and understanding it. That must be kind of exciting, right? I, are you in like... Are you in like this deep data pool <laughs> that you're that you're just paddling in and enjoying? I mean, t- talk about that difference between where you've come from traditionally on more on the traditional side and where and and what it's like now. You know, the market is moving in the direction. There's so much data available, and and I am a bit of a nerd. I do like the data side of this, and I'm fascinated by it. And I think we do a couple things very very well here, probably better than I've seen at other places in terms of a commitment to third-party data. We first have a dedicated resource. This is the first time in my career I've had a dedicated resource to emerging technologies and emerging data sources. And her job all day is to find these third-party data sources and these advanced technologies that are going to change our business in the next one, two, and three, even five years. And her, in terms of third-party data, what she's looking for is, sure, we're looking at the traditional data sources. We have great partnerships with um, existing traditional long-term data partners like Verisk and CoreLogic and emerging data sources like Keep Analytics. We've, we have a number of partners that are set up, but are there other partners that are in the industry, that are in insurance, that are just emerging with new sources of data that can complement and supplement existing data sources. But are there, equally, are there data sources that haven't traditionally been thought of as part of an insurance framework that are mm-hmm. servicing other industries that might have a use case within insurance? So we have a, a, a really uh, uh, committed effort to look at new data sources coming in. Then once you have them, you have to think, how do I test them? How do I figure out whether they work or they don't work? And we do have a committed data science team um, that's both in the U.S. and in Israel that has established a consistent process for evaluating new data sources. So what we can do is bring in large data sets and put them through various uh, tests. And I think most of the time we think of it as uh, let's predict loss. But there's a lot of things in our business to predict, a lot of metrics, whether it's renewal retention, it's conversion ratio. What's, you know, how does this predict alignment with our value proposition? How does it predict whether somebody is likely to maintain their home in good condition or not? And so we're using the data to, to think about it, to think about those questions differently and apply them differently. And then third is how do you implement those new data sources? And can you do it efficiently, do it effectively, and do it quickly? And our tech stack really allows us to do that, right? So we can deploy new APIs at a very quick pace, and there is almost no limit to the capacity of number of APIs that we can we can implement into our process. And that gives us an incredible amount of flexibility in terms of implementation. Certainly an important aspect of Hippo's business model is technology and using it in all kinds of new, clever and creative ways. I mean, that's kind of a 
core foundation of the company. Can you tell our listeners about how you guys are using technology to uh, improve and change the insurance experience for customers? Sure. Our president, Rick McCatherine, I think, who's, who's been on your podcast before, right. says, you know, InsureTech is equal parts insurance and technology. And, you know, the real important thing is here, how do we leverage that technology really to facilitate and improve the insurance business? So technology really for us has two key advantages. One is to improve the customer experience and the other is to help identify and mitigate risk for our client. So a couple of examples of how we, w- we would do that. So, you know, a simpler approach to insurance buying. Traditionally, you know, the, the, the application process for insurance has caused friction with customers. We, they ask 70 questions about a home. Oftentimes the client doesn't know the answer to the question. They bought the house two years ago. They don't know that the roof was replaced eight years ago. And asking them just frustrates them and takes a long time. We've implemented third-party data into our new business process. So we don't have to ask all those questions. We can provide a quote within 60 seconds, and we can bind a policy within five minutes because our tech stack allows us to go out to third-party data sources, bring it into our process, eliminate the question and the friction with the insured, and most likely get more accurate information into our quoting process. That's one end of the spectrum. And then on the other end of the spectrum, as we talked about with the smart home devices, we are actively promoting putting these devices in the in the home for the client so that they avoid the claims experience in totality. Those are two ways that we're thinking about, okay, how do we make insurance not about doing a new business application and then the next time you contact your insurer is when you have a claim. There's got to be places in between as well that we we, we interact with them. I mean, technology has changed the way that insurance, what really all parts of our lives are done. You know, in my head, whenever I think about somebody getting a new policy on a homeowner, I don't know why I think back to like, you know, big offices with individual people at a desk, looking at a policy, writing it out, you know, thinking that how has underwriting changed with this technology? When did it go from having to go sit at a human's desk to being able to to rate a policy in 60 seconds? Talk to me a little bit about that change and, and kind of what all's happened there. Yeah, I think there's several points in the process probably that improved that process for everybody. The We've talked a little bit about the explosion of third-party data that's available to us. You know, maybe 20 years ago, we didn't have the building information that we have available to us. We didn't have the technology to be able to take that information and apply it in a format that made sense for us. And we didn't have the technology and the platforms to be able to run logic against those. The the key here, right, is, you know, I, I grew up in an insurance company where we had over a hundred underwriters sitting on a on a floor, sitting at our cubes and hand writing on applications. Today, what we're able to do is really narrow down the policies that we have to spend time on. More importantly, we're able to provide a straight through processing experience for clients and tell them that they have cover immediately. And that really makes a huge difference in the customer experience to be able to quote them with accuracy, tell them what the price is going to be and tell them that they have coverage within five minutes. It's all because we've enabled third-party data and technology. So underwriting is more focused on the exceptions. Are, are you saying that the technology helps you identify the optimal candidates that come through? And those are straight through processing. You don't have to look at those, think about those, reconsider those, because Correct. they check all the boxes. Correct. And is that what technology does for you? It says, here's 34 boxes where, that can be checked. This one has 33 of them. I don't need to slow down the process and create friction with a customer for somebody to tell me that they check all those boxes if third-party data and and a computer can tell me that, and technology can tell me that they've checked all those boxes. So is that where you guys spend your time on, is on the ones that come through and only four of the 35 boxes are checked? Correct. Correct. Yes. And that's really important for how we identify our client who is aligned with the hippo message and is willing to partner with us in protecting the joy of their home ownership, right? So clients who resonate with our message uh, about home mitigation and the smart home devices that we provide to them, as well as the hippo home care services that we provide as well. 
there's clearly evidence that underwriting has gotten faster. Mm -hmm. Is it better? Are the results better today than they were 15, 20, 30 years ago? Yes, I would say it has. And I think technology and, and again, third-party data has, has helped with that. We've been able to better match rate to risk and re matching rate to risk is, is beneficial to insured and it's beneficial to the insurer um, so that we can better assess what the risk is and make sure that you get the proper rate for, for the exposure that, that you have. Um, I think the technology has also helped service clients in um, being properly insured and be, having their home insured to value. Mm. It's done better in evaluating and identifying exposures insureds may have to make sure that they have proper liability limits. For example, two things that we do that I think are really important in terms of maintaining uh, insurance coverage levels for our insureds is at each renewal, instead of applying annual renewal inflation factors, what we do is we rerun a replacement cost estimator with new data every year to make sure if the house got larger, they added an addition, we can make sure that they have the proper limits. Likewise, if they added a swimming pool, we would be able to identify that, reach out to them, confirm that, and make sure that they have proper liability limits as it, as it is an increased hazard for them. Those are all ways in which we've both improved how we price and how we identify and examine risk and also help clients move on and probably ensure their risk through time as their exposures change. You talked a few minutes ago about that you have uh, a bunch of data scientists at your beck and call, which is probably a pretty cool thing. I mean, you know, if I if I had a bunch of data scientists at my beck and call, I'd have them like researching what my next car is and, you know, I mean what clothes I should buy. I mean, everything, but, but I, I'm sure that's not the case with you. Talk a little bit about the data sets that you choose. What, what makes Hippo special? How are you using all this, all, your data scientists? Talk about um, your review and testing process. The data science team has created and established a standard format for, um, for evaluating new data sources as they come in. The data team as I said, only don't only look at policies or look at data as it comes in and think about how it affects loss cost data. They're looking at it and thinking about how does it impact a number of other metrics. For example, we have our own in-house data, which we're able to look at and say, what risk characteristics are indicative of a home that's likely well-maintained? And we're able then to identify customers that should be going through an easy path that don't require the extra expense or the hassle of, of receiving an insurance inspection. Um, and we're able to straight through process those, those clients. The other ways in which they are currently working is to enhance our underwriting and, and pricing models so that we can ensure that you know, we can use third-party data that's available to us and our in-house data and bring that together in order to come up with insights into our portfolio to uh, create better underwriting and pricing models as well. So with all of this data out there, I would imagine pretty much every insurance company has access to this third-party data. They don't have access to, to, to your data, but they have access to their own. But everyone has this third-party data access. So is it up to the insurance company to really manipulate this data, uh, to make their models work so that they can deliver the best price uh, and, and continue to grow? I mean, is that, is that kind of a race for the insurance companies to make sure that they can do their, their best work with this data? That's a great question. We see it as a strategic differentiator. Our approach to it, our willingness to adopt new data sources and to find key insights within that data is key to our success as we go forward. Obviously, we need strong relationships with the traditional data suppliers, as I mentioned before, Veris, CoreLogic, Keep Analytics, and we get really strong data from those uh, those folks to help us with our underwriting decision making. But we're also looking at other data sources that come from outside the traditional insurance space. And we speak to incubators, we speak to other insure tech startups, we, we talk to many in the industry to try and understand what's out there and what's new and what's coming. And if we're doing our jobs, we're ahead of the curve and we see what's coming, we see what's valuable, and we're, we're trying to implement those into our insights into our business. Let's talk about you for a minute. You were a longtime Chubb guy. Well, Chubb, Ace, et cetera, 
right? Yes, you, correct. You, I mean, the big part of your career was at that organization. How did that help to prepare you for where you are today? Talk a little bit about that journey. Sure. I grew up in the insurance industry at, at ACE, um, and it was where I, it's a wonderful organization and incredible insurance professionals and inc- incredible insurance leadership. And what they taught me was how to be a balanced underwriter, how to think about growth and profit in balance and make sure that as we build an insurance company, as we build an insurance organization, our job is not just to, to you know, run a 90 combined ratio or grow 20%. The difficult thing is how to do both at the same time mm. and how do you manage those those needs. And to me, it's it's really looking at the portfolio management, as I discussed earlier, and looking at that balance, finding the customers we need to write. And I think they provided me that basis where I think the move to Hippo has transitioned my career is to thinking more forward about the use of technology and the use of these third party data sources to create insights into our book that take us beyond that, that help. The mission is still the same. And, you know, InsureTech hasn't necessarily changed the nature of insurance. It has changed the way that we are going to go about this and how we're going to succeed in the marketplace, how we're going to interact with our customers, and how we are going to provide them solutions to the problems that are posed by home ownership. I mean, you're a you're a a very accomplished and seasoned insurance professional. You've been around, you've seen it, you've seen it all. I mean, like you said, you you were in the rooms where there was, you know, a hundred underwriters and everybody probably had a stack of files on their desk and they just went through them one at a time, right? To where it is today. Is it changing that much? Is the promise of InsureTech here yet? Or is it just over the horizon? I, I mean, are, how do you feel about that? I think InsureTech is impactful and influential in the market today. And I think in 2022, we are definitely seeing innovation to key problems like, you know, a trend in the marketplace, for instance, being water damage claims. About 30% of non uh, of, of, of claims in 2019, I believe it is, came from water damage claims. That's been a historical issue through time. Yeah. The way that we solve that problem and the way that we address that problem is moving forward because of some of the things that InsureTech is doing. So the water prevent, the water loss prevention devices, the water leak detectors, water shutoff valves, the way that we're going about implementing that and putting that into the market, how we're incenting the uses of those is changing how we address long-term existing problems. Uh, climate change, how we take the science that is around climate change, there's no doubt that it has changed the insurance environment. How can we bring that data to bear? How the satellite imagery, uh, the satellite data, the aerial imagery, the weather forecast, the weather modeling uh, techniques, how can we take that to help people understand what the exposures are to their homes going forward and provide them the the means uh, to, to avoid loss and to mitigate loss going forward? I think InsureTech is absolutely at the forefront of implementing those thoughts into the market and pushing innovation forward. Is there missing data out there right now? Is there data you wish you had uh, that you wish somebody would go out and grab so that it it could help you? Uh, Or is it everything you can think of just at your fingertips now? There's such an enormous amount of data at this point that is out there. It's, It's almost revolutionary. Yeah. I'm, I'm scared that I've got enough to think about with all of that right there. With all the stuff you actually have. <laughs> I, I, sometimes I feel my plate is full, but you know, I, I do. I, I have crazy ideas every once in a while. Like, and yeah. this is a silly one, right? But like, I want to know how much people spend on landscaping because okay. people who, who spend, uh, have you ever seen a house that was in disrepair, but had a wonderfully manicured lawn? Like, that's a gra- that's those great, that's great. Good one. But those are, those are the ways I think that we have to be thinking about risk differently. We have to be right. thinking about who the client is and the enormous amount of data out there will help us answer those questions going forward. Look at that. You'll be working with Mint or one of those online budgeting tools before long. That, that, that might be one of your third parties. That's super clever. I love that idea, but you're absolutely right. I mean, if pride of ownership equals probably a better risk in general. 
Correct. Yeah. Right? Here, here's another quote. We were talking about the water detection devices and you might not have this information, but but you you do internally have the information for the number of people who actually receive it, open the box and install it. Is there a, a decline in people who actually keep it going long term? Eventually a battery runs out, eventually something. And and the water detection, nobody ever thinks about it until there's a water loss. Like I have I have notion. Right. And I installed it a couple of months ago and I always forget that I have it because it's a water detect. I don't have a leak. But if it ran out of batteries, I'd probably be like, I don't know. I might not fix that. Is there is there any data on that? This is part of continuous underwriting and continuous engagement with our clients and making sure that they know the importance of checking the batteries. Right. And replacing yeah, the yeah. batteries. It, 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 it is not significantly different than fire alarms, right? And, you know, we try to communicate with our clients and let them know that, hey, every six months you should be changing the batteries that are, that, that, that are in your fire alarm. Um, and, and if we can improve the engagement with our customer around these smart home devices, it'll increase their awareness. And what we want to do is engage with clients who, who see the value in that, who, who right. are actively engaged in uh, looking at their smart home devices, making sure that they're turned on, that understand the value of them, that understand the issues that surround water damage claims to their homes and the, and the, and the security of their homes. Well, we just need to get all these water detection devices to beep real loud in the middle of the night, and then we'll all go change our batteries. It works for fire alarms. It should work for those things. I just had that experience not two nights ago. So Hippo is a really interesting company because it was founded by people that didn't have deep insurance backgrounds, but needless to say, amazing, brilliant people who are tremendously accomplished and have accomplished a great thing just to bring Hippo to where it is today. So you're having a C-level meeting. You have these go-go people, bright, creative. I mean, just the whole business plan of, of Hippo, on the one hand, as simple as it is, is revolutionary at the same time. Are you the guy in the room who has to say, no, wait a minute, hold on, slow down. Is that, is that your role? Are you, are, is that what the chief underwriting officer does? I mean, and, and, how do you do that? Where's the? How do you find that balance in a in a supercharged, high growth, high success company without your uh, combined ratio, you know, being four hundred? How do you do that? You know, and I don't see this as an, an, an insure tech thing. Like there is in every organization, the the tension between growth and profit, and the idea is to balance those two. I have to say, when I came on board at Hippo, the amount of insurance understanding within the organization, even amongst the insurance, uh, the IT folks, was remarkable considering it wasn't necessarily started by hardcore long-term insurance folks. Part of the inventiveness, I don't know, ingenuity, innovative nature of the organization is because you didn't have 25-year veterans sitting in the room saying, I've tried that. It didn't work. I tried this. It didn't work. Right. I think I'm entering at a very interesting time where four years, right, we're hitting a certain size that, you know, are we a startup anymore? Are we kind of, I don't know, are we adolescents? Are we adults? Yeah. We're growing as an organization and the needs have changed. And I think it's entering at a different time and I'm being challenged to, okay, put aside all of your preconceived notions about how the in industry works and be open to turning certain things on its head. And I have to say, not only, I, I think, you know, folks have learned from some of us that just started over the last uh, few months or the last year. But I think I'm learning just as much from folks with a different perspective on it. Um, that really wasn't prevalent in my, in my former employers. Isn't it hard to sit there in those, some of those meetings and say, Oh, I've done that before. I know, what's, I know this story. <laughs> but one of the advantages is I've done that before. It didn't work. Why didn't it work? And right, what's different right. now? And what could we do differently about it now to approach mm -hmm. that same problem? And I think that's, uh, that's the perspective that we're taking, uh, I, I can't say that uh, it doesn't take intentional effort to yeah. unlearn habits for that you have over 25 years. Right. To be open-minded to something that like just has traditionally not been effective or worked or whatever. And, and I think what's refreshing is, you know, Rick has said this in, in several, several meetings re recently, like we have to take ourselves back to what we 
what's the core issue here? There's a customer at the end of every single transaction. Yeah. That in the talk about insure tech or non insure tech or legacy carrier or traditional carrier, really it all comes back to the same thing. There's a customer at the end of the transaction who we need to service in the most efficient way possible to make their experience valuable to them that it's not just a transaction where they're paying us money, that they're getting something out of this. And how can we leverage our expertise, our technological expertise, our underwriting expertise, our customer service expertise, our sales expertise into providing them that best uh, experience um, and not be held down by whatever the traditional constraints have been to think outside the box, to be willing to take chances, to will be willing to take different data sources, different technologies, implement them into the process. If they don't work, we move on from it and we move to the next thing. But at the end of the day, it's all about whether we're performing that service for that client and giving them the best insurance experience that they can possibly have. So I want to ask you before we go, I mean, you've ascended in the industry You've been chief underwriting officer a couple of times, I think. Um, so this is not exactly a new gig yeah. to you. You would understand going from a company like AIG to a little company like Hippo, if it was your first time, maybe a first time opportunity. What makes a guy go from being the global head underwriter of personal property at the largest or one of the largest insurance companies in the world, AIG, to a little old hippo. What tell us that story? The opportunity to do things that, quite frankly, took a long time to do in other organizations. And this is around risk mitigation. This is about providing value to our customers beyond an indemnity product. This is about having the ability to think about clients differently. All the things that we've talked about in the last 45 minutes were lures for me into this organization. First, I have a um, desire to build. I enjoy building things. I enjoy the freedom and accountability that provides all at the same time. What I would really want to do is be able to take new thoughts, things that didn't lift off the ground in other places and put them into place. The mission to help people protect the joy of home ownership resonates. We have effectively gone out and uh, created this smart home program that doesn't exist elsewhere. I want to see that grow to, you know, a sizable share of the market, right? Whether it's, a, you know, a billion, five billion, whatever the company, whatever the size of the company grows to, what I want to be able to do is expand this mission to as, as large a market share as we possibly can um, in a responsible way, managing the underwriting bottom line and growing the business with clients that are aligned with what we're trying to do. Yeah, I think that's really I cool. That. I think the opportunity to be in, on a large level, macro level, being you're in the same sandbox but you're in a you're in a whole different corner of it with a group that's trying to build a sandcastle that's never been built before, and that's really cool. That's really fun. So you get to use all the expertise you have, but kind of in in a new with a new idea. Inv that's invigorating. Yeah, and how do you use twenty five years of learnings to do something different than what you've ever done before? Mm -hmm. And We've all sat in their desks before and said, man, if I could only do this, if I, you know, if I could convince so-and-so of doing this, we'd be king of the world. Yeah. Well, we have that opportunity here because it's a small organization. There's an entrepreneurial uh, spirit about it, which allows for experimentation. And we are really, we all have the same goal in, in, at the end of the day. And it's how, how best to serve our customers in a responsible way and grow profitably. We're super happy for you that you uh, found a great home to get to play in the sandbox at. And as you know, we're super fond of many, many, many of your coworkers and, yeah. and of the company. And just speaking for Lee and I, you guys have been enormously generous to us. And if you're anywhere near as generous to your, your customers, of which I assume you're even more so, then uh, it's a really successful formula. And we thank you for taking well, the time you. to be with yes, us. Yes, thank you so much, Chris. No, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Is Chris the first underwriter we've had on? No. Oh, we no. had we had, we had Mr. Weber. Yeah, Mr. Weber on. 
But he was more of a venture capitalist who had a background and under a huge background. Huge, yeah, right. I Uh, mean, but but yeah, Chris. Yeah, Chris was the first. I enjoyed listening to Chris uh, talk about the underwriting side, and and just like every hippo person who's ever been on, they leave me with this feeling of excitement for hippo. Uh, The way that they think about their customer, the way that they do business. Every episode has always left me thinking, man, that's a pretty cool company. And Chris is no different. Pretty cool guy. Yeah. You know, one of the interesting questions that we asked him was, you know, why would you make a change from where you were to where you are? Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, it's about, it's about building and they're building something at Hippo. Say what you want about Hippo. Think what you want about Hippo. You can't deny that they're trying to build something new and different. And that's really exciting. And, uh, and yeah. for, pe- for people like you or me who have worked in our career for a long time, that's exciting to be part of something different like that. I, I would agree for him him to be at a place where it was it was is what it is. This is the way you do business. We've always done business this way. Uh, for him to be able to say, what about these new new nifty ideas that I have? And he can actually implement them. So I think he's in the right place and he has a great uh, mindset that matches all of those other guys there. We thank Chris for being with us. Thank you, Hippo Marketing Team, who does such a communications team, That's does right. such a great job, Andrea and staff. And thank you so much for everything you do for FNO and SureTech. Yep. And thank you for listening to FNO and SureTech. And until next time. Goodbye, everybody.